Hey guys, today we're going to start talking about Greek astronomers and philosophers. Uh, these first few astronomers that uh, we're going to talk about, they were actually mostly uh, philosophers. So the difference is, in philosophy, um, these guys, they basically just sat around and, and tried to think about things. Like, you know, what is the earth made of? Where are we at in the sky? Why are we here? And they tried to add reasoning to their beliefs. So before this time period, um, before the Greeks here, uh, basically everything was just uh, religious based. So you didn't have to give an explanation because it's just the way it was. So Thales and Anaximander, they are, they're actually trying to use reasoning and explaining why the earth and the, the sky is the way it is. So Thales is the first one. So he was born sometime around 625 BC and then died 547 BC, sometime right around then, you know, around 78 years old or so, something like that. Uh, there are no works of his, so everything we know of him is based upon um, other philosophers and astronomers. And Thales is actually one of the, he's, he's the, the original philosopher, basically. He's one of the original seven wise men of ancient Greece. And both Thales and Anaximander, they're both uh, uh, born in uh, Miletus, which is now part of Turkey. It's an ancient Greek town. And Thales is, is really famous for a couple a couple reasons. So he taught really, really, um, you know, the, the greats of ancient Greece, Greece uh, Aristotle, Anaximander. <clears throat> Those are examples of uh, students of his. Uh, and a couple of things he was able to do uh, based upon what is written about him is he was actually able to predict a solar eclipse. So he is the first person in recorded history to predict a solar eclipse. It actually happened uh, during a war that was fought, and it actually stopped the war and, and turned the tide of the war. That was the eclipse he was able to, uh, to predict. He also believed that everything living, everything, well, not, not even living, just everything in general, the earth itself, you, me, uh, everything is made of water. He believed water is the essence of everything, and so everything is made of water. And so he actually thought the earth uh, was a flat disk floating on this huge sea of water. And that made sense to him because if you go to the beach and look out at the horizon, you just see, you know, horizon, flat uh, flat ocean just going and going and going forever. And so he believed that the that sea actually kept the earth afloat and that everything is actually made of water because water is the essence to life. We all need water to survive. Okay, Anaximander, he was, uh, he's a student of Thales. And uh, he had, so he had similar beliefs to Thales, except they were a little different. And these guys, they, they did a lot more than just, uh, you know, thinking about the sky and uh, the earth, things like that. They, they studied math. Uh, and they, they, they tried to put reasoning behind every aspect of their life. And the reason they could do this, guys, um, they, they were bored. So they, they had to do something, they did something for fun. That This was entertainment for them. So... They sat around and they just thought about things and tried to, you know, come up with explanations and use reasoning as to why these things occurred because it was entertainment. You know, back then, uh, if you went to a party, you know, they didn't get to talk about, you know, their favorite college football team or their pay, play, favorite video game or things like that. They, they actually went and they talked about science and, and books and, you know, manuscripts, readings that they're doing. Uh, that's what they did for entertainment. So that's the one thing I want you to get from this is these guys, they're not boring guys. These guys are quite, inter, uh, they're, they're quite fun. These are very important, powerful people. And uh, they did this for fun. This is what they did for fun back then. They enjoyed learning. So Anaximander, he is a student of Thales. And his views are just a little different. So he actually believes uh, not that everything comes from water, but he calls it a pyron which means unlimited, the unlimited or the boundless. And he believes, uh, you know, everything ends up after it dies, it become, it goes back and becomes part of a pyron or the boundless. Uh, and that's what gives you uh, opposites, hot and cold, life and death. That's what he came up with that idea. It's called a pyron. And he actually was able to give a description of uh, the celestial bodies. And he actually probably made a celestial sphere as well. So when he looked up in the sky, when he saw the moon and the sun, he actually believed that those were actually hollow rings. And inside the, the, uh, the hollowness, uh, you had fire. And that's what created the light that was given off by the sun and the moon. 
And he believed that during, say, an eclipse, a solar eclipse or something, that those rings were actually, there were, there were vents in the rings, and those vents open and close. And when the vents close, that's what causes the eclipse to occur, and that's what causes the moon phases. When those vents were open, that's when you had uh, the sun, uh, sun shining bright, and then you had the full moon. So he was able to describe what he thought of these uh, objects like the sun and the moon and the stars. And he also believed that the Earth wasn't a flat disk, but it was actually a flat cylinder. I know, big difference there, but he thought it was a flat cylinder. And uh, it wasn't floating in water, it was just kind of floating in, uh, in emptiness. So it was, just, it was just there, right in the middle, and everything else was, was around it. So it, it was just floating there, right in the center, with everything else perfectly distance around it. <clears throat> okay? And he thought the stars and the moon were just perforated spheres, like I said a second ago. Uh, hollow rings with vents in them, that's what he, he believed. Um, so these were the first two guys. There's very little work that remains of Anaximander as well. Most of the information we have about Thales and Anaximander come from actually other philosophers, Greek philosophers that we're going to talk about like Aristotle. So next up on our list, we're talking about Pythagoras. Okay, next up we have Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras is also a Greek philosopher. He's actually born in the Greek town of Samos. Later, he actually moved to uh, Italy because of the persecution he was facing in Samos. And he was a very interesting dude, to say the least. So when he actually moved, he, he started, uh, he, he, had, he opened up a school. And this school, it was kind of, it was more like a cult, actually. So he actually had all of his, father, his followers, and his followers were called the Pythagoreans. So Pythagoras, we're all familiar with Pythagoras because we've all heard, we've all heard of the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared in a right triangle. This is the Pythagoras that came up with that. So he was very big into math, <clears throat> but he did also do some things with astronomy as well. Um, and again, he is a philosopher, so he, he's trying to explain why things are the way they are. Uh, there is no evidence to back this stuff up yet. That comes in just a little while. Uh, later on, about 450 BC, that's when evidence starts to back it up. But they're just trying to reason through things here. And so Pythagoras had his followers called the Pythagoreans. And we don't actually know what work came from Pythagoras and what work came from his disciples, because basically anything that his disciples wrote, they wrote in the name of Pythagoras, uh, because they just, they loved him so much. So since Pythagoras was really big into math and numbers and shapes, geometry, uh, he actually believed that the earth was a perfectly round sphere. He also thought that all the heavenly bodies, every object you see in the sky is a perfect sphere. And that just makes sense to him because a sphere is a perfect shape. Therefore, all these objects in the sky, they're just all, they're all perfect. He also uh, came up, uh, he also believed in the geocentric model of the universe, which says the earth is the very center of the universe and everything is orbiting around the earth. And he actually thought that they were all orbiting around the earth, <clears throat> all those celestial bodies, the planets and the stars and the moon and the sun. They were orbiting around the Earth in these crystalline spheres. And if you listen carefully, he believed he could actually, he was one of the only ones that could hear it, but he, he believed that if you listen carefully, you could actually hear music coming from the, the movement of the stars and the planets. And he called that the harmony of the spheres. So really, really, really interesting fellow here. So he believed music was coming from these objects. And he also believed that um, the, the planets and the sun and the moon, they were... Uh, certain distances away based upon harmonics of music. because uh, So he just he was really big in the numbers and he came up with this idea of harmony of the spheres and he believed that everything was perfectly round based upon everything being a sphere. And then he came up with this idea of geocentrism with the earth as the center of the universe. That's a big deal because uh, that lasts for a really, really, really long time. That idea that geocentric earth is the center. So take a look at this photo here. <clears throat> you uh, definitely don't see things like this coming from uh, you know NASA and things like this now with the shape of the Earth here. Take a look. So there's the Earth, there's the Moon, and then this would be the Sun. So notice the shape of the Earth. Hopefully you can see that that looks like a flat disk. And then there's the Moon, 
and then take a look at the sun. Notice what the sun's doing here. So the sun is actually being carried across in a chariot. So this represents the Greek depiction of Helios, who is the sun god. His Roman counterpart, his name is Sol, but this is Greek Helios. Helios is different than Apollo. We'll get into that later on when we start talking about constellations. They are not the same person. Helios is the sun god. His responsibility was to carry the sun across the sky from east to west every day in his chariot. And then he'd get in a cup, sit in a cup, and then float back across the ocean in the north uh, to get back uh, to the east uh, in the morning. So this is what the Greeks believed at the time, how the sun moved across the sky. So Helios taking his chariot across the sky with the earth being a flat disk and then sailed, across a uh, uh, sailed back across the ocean at night to the east. And so all the major theories at this time had the earth as the center of the universe. And all these theories were either religiously based or philosophy based. Uh, they're not science based yet. So it's not until around 450 BC where science, scientific theories start replacing religious ones and f philosophical ones. So that's coming up um, with the next few astronomers that we start talking about here. <clears throat> so around this time, 450 BC or so, that's when the Greeks actually discover that the Earth is round. So we're going to talk about that with Aristotle coming up. Um, and then they... Uh, that discovery led to different theories about the sun, moon, planets uh, in orbit around the Earth. Uh, be, and like I said with uh, Pythagoras, some of these theories were kind of strange. So it said that uh, the seven moving bodies, notice I said seven there, sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, the reason they're not here is because you have to use a telescope to see them. Telescopes are not invented until 1608, 1609, right around there. So uh, you can't see them yet. So it's going to be a while before we actually get to Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But a lot of these ideas that were religious-based and philosophical-based uh, thought that these objects in the sky, these celestial bodies, were just little crystalline, crystalline spheres. Uh, just They were very small, and you know they're just, they're, they were actually filled with, it's called quintessence, which is just like heavenly, uh, he heavenly, heaven, it's what heaven is made of, basically. You know, they probably believed if you build a big enough ladder, you could actually go up, climb the ladder, and, and touch these objects. And they believed that each one of these little spheres had its own little sphere it could rotate in, uh, revolve around uh, the Earth in. So, very interesting theories back then with the geo with geocentrism, with what these objects are in the sky. Okay, so next thing, we're next person we're talking about is Aristotle. So next up on our list, we're going to talk about Aristotle for just a little bit. So Aristotle is also a Greek philosopher. Um, he's got some pretty fam a pretty famous teacher. Uh, so he was actually, Aristotle was actually taught by Plato. Plato was actually taught by Socrates. And then Aristotle, he actually taught Alexander the Great. So Aristotle's around the time period 384 to 322 BC. And I want you to know, really know two things about Aristotle. I want you to know his what he believed about uh, the universe. So he believed that we lived in a geocentric universe, which means Earth is the center. He borrowed a lot of a lot of his ideas from um, Pythagoras and Exodus. So he said the Earth is the center. He believed with Pythagoras that the Earth is a perfect sphere and that the Earth did not move. Obviously, the Earth does not move because if you drop something, it always drops straight down to the center. And that's what actually got him thinking that the Earth is actually a perfect sphere. Because the only it doesn't matter where you are on the Earth, no matter where you're at, if you drop something, if you drop a ball, it will always drop straight down to the center of the Earth. And so in order for that to happen, the Earth would have to be a perfect sphere. If the Earth was not a perfect sphere, there would be some place on the Earth where you could drop a ball and it wouldn't drop straight down. It would drop at an angle. But since the Earth is a perfect sphere, ball, uh, an object will always fall straight down to the center. Always, always, always. So that was his view of uh, geocentrism with the Earth being a perfect uh, sphere. Um, he also, so there were three lines of evidence to help him prove that the Earth was round. So a perfect sphere round. We're not talking about flat disk anymore. We're talking about a you know, perfectly round sphere. So um, he was the first to provide three lines of evidence to prove the spherical Earth. So here are his three lines. And I just mentioned one of them. I'm going to talk about the other two.
So falling objects, we said, falling objects will always fall straight down to the center. An object uh, has to be a perfect sphere for that to happen. Second thing, lunar eclipses. So uh, Aristotle, he observed several lunar eclipses. And what he noticed is whenever you look at a lunar eclipse, you can actually see the edge of the Earth on the moon during a lunar eclipse. So he looked up there and saw the shape of the edge, and he said, well, obviously the Earth is a perfectly round sphere because you can actually see the shape of it on the moon. So he was the first to actually say that. And then his third observation was he, uh, he observed stars. So I just told you a minute ago that uh, uh, Aristotle was a teacher of Alexander the Great. So hopefully you're familiar with Ale Alexander the Great and what he has done. So Alexander the Great is called Alexander the Great because uh, he conquered basically the known world. And so whenever, in order to do that, he had to travel quite a bit. He had to go, he had to move north and south from his uh, location. And whenever he moved north and south, you know, he would bring his, his uh, teacher along with him, Aristotle, sometimes. And as Aristotle traveled, he noticed that the stars in the sky, they would change. They would change uh, their position in the sky. And Aristotle reasoned that, well, the only way that these stars are going to change their position is if the Earth were round. So the reason they're changing their position is because we are actually walking over the curvature of the Earth. But since the Earth is so big, you can't actually see the curvature because it happens so slowly over, over, uh, distance that, over time and distance that you're traveling. So, for instance, let's use the example of... Uh, um, Polaris. So Polaris is the North Star. Okay, it's called the North Star because it's fixed in in a uh, in one location uh, in the sky. So where we live, you'll see Polaris. Uh, it's out in the sky. Um, and if you look where we live, you'll see it eh, about halfway up in the sky, and it's always going to be about halfway up in the sky. But if you were to go to say the North Pole and look at Polaris, where would it be? It would be right above your head because we have changed, we've gone north. If you go to the equator and look at Polaris, uh, you wouldn't be able to see Polaris because it would be right at the horizon. So as you move north and south, you'll see that stars will actually change their height in the sky. And Aristotle reasoned that the only way that happens is if the Earth were actually curved and you're walking along the curvature of the Earth. So those three lines of evidence help him prove that the Earth is round. Pretty clever guy. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture now. So see if you can tell what's going on here. This looks like a pretty happening place. Um, you, you have some, oops. <laughs> I think I just told you the answer, but that's okay. So you have uh, some guys here. Looks like they're studying something here, maybe. Uh, he's got a tool. Looks like he's measuring something in the sky. I see a bunch of boats out in the, in the, in the sea here. And it looks like there's a, there's a town here right off the coast. And then look at this building here. You have a very large building here on the top of a hill. Uh, and looks like it's a pretty, pretty huge place. Um, so this place right here, this is actually the city of Alexandria. So Alexandria, we just mentioned Alexander the Great a minute ago with Aristotle. So Alexandria is named after Alexander the Great. Alexandria is a town in Egypt, right on the coast. And this is the place that started around 300 BC. It's actually like 331 BC, but 300 BC, close enough. You don't have to know these dates. So it's, uh, Alexandria is, was founded, and it becomes the center of anything, uh, of all educational fields. All learning happens here in Alexandria. It's a very, uh, very famous place. If you wanted to learn anything, you would go to Alexandria, and there's a reason why that was. It's because Alexandria has the largest library in the world. It's called a uh, very famous library of, library of Alexandria. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist today because it burned down when the Greeks were taken over by the Romans. Julius Caesar actually burned down the, the, the Library of Alexandria. But Alexandria is known for three buildings, so you, uh, three, three places. You've got this tall building here. This is actually the Lighthouse of Alexandria. It was one of the seven wonders. Of, it was one of the original wonders of the world. Um, there's still remnants today that in the ocean. Uh, it, it collapsed and fell down into the ocean. The ocean took it over. But uh, the remnants are still there. So it was known for the White House of Alexandria, the Library of Alexandria, and then the, the Necropolis. Uh, those are the three things in Alexandria. Alexandria is, you know, there's still a, town, a city in Egypt. Uh, but during this time period, it was the largest city in the world. 
uh, eventually uh, Rome becomes the largest, uh, taking over Alexandria's spot. But uh, it, it was the place where you would go to study if you wanted to learn anything. And keep in mind, you know, guys, re remember who could actually go and study. Uh, what, you know, what did you have to be if you wanted to go study something? Think about who all these Greek philosophers uh, were uh, that we've been talking about. And these are those astro astrologers from the ancient civilizations. They are very, very important, powerful people. Uh, and the reason they can do this is because they have money. They don't have regular jobs where they have to go work the fields, anything like that. So uh, they're doing this because they have money. They, they don't have to work. So this gives them entertainment. They, they like this. This is their profession. This is what they're doing for fun. They're bored. And so they go and they, uh, they study. So Alexandria happens, 300 BC, and it includes all fields of learning, including astronomy. So that's important for these next few guys we're, talking, we're going to talk about coming up because um, they, they live right around Alexandria. And some of them are even the librarians in the famous uh, Library of Alexandria. So for the next 500 years or so, uh, careful observations of the heavens led to many theories of the cosmos, one of them being the Ptolemaic model of geocentrism, which is what we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Okay, next up we have Aristarchus of Samos. So remember Samos is in, uh, just an island off the coast of Egypt. It's, one, it's a Greek town at the, uh, during this time period. But he, this guy lived from 310 to 230 BC, which means he was right after the time of Aristotle. And I really just want you to know uh, one thing about Aristarchus. He was the first to say that the Earth is not the center of the universe. He was the first to come up with the idea of a heliocentric universe, which means the sun is actually the center. So Aristarchus actually put the sun in the center, and then he put Mercury, Venus, and then the Earth revolving around the sun as the third planet from the sun with the moon moving around the Earth. He then went and put the other planets in their proper spots as well. He also said that stars are just are really, really far away, and they are objects just like our sun is. Uh, now, at this time period, he didn't have too many followers. Not too many people believed him because he, he could not uh, back it up. He tried his hardest to prove this with, with math, uh, and he tried to actually measure the distance between the Earth, Moon, and Sun, but his calculations are just way off because... During this time period, uh, we didn't, he didn't have the technology needed to figure out the math. But it is pretty amazing to think about that back, back then, 300, you know, 200, 230, uh, 250 BC, right around then, he was able to come up with this idea for heliocentrism, which means sun-centered universe. You know, a thousand years later in the Dark Ages, uh, there, a thousand years after this, there are still people that believe that the Earth was flat uh, in the center. So pretty amazing that this theory is out uh, during this time period and not too many people believe him. But again, it's because there just wasn't a way to prove it. And at the time, we mentioned Aristotle a minute ago, uh, just think about the time. I mean, people thought back then that, you know, if the earth were moving, you'd be able to feel it. But obviously the earth isn't moving because you can't feel it. So therefore the earth is stationary, which means it's in the center. We now know today that that's not the case. Uh, just like in a moving car, you're moving the same speed as the car. Uh, so if you're not accelerating, if you're going at constant speed, you can't actually feel the car moving. So we know that today, but it wasn't until later on that that was actually proven. So pretty smart guy. is able to figure out uh, that the Earth is not the center of the universe, that we live in a heliocentric universe, and it was just a competing theory. So it's not until later on when we, we start talking about Copernicus where people are really going to start to uh, notice the heliocentric view of the universe. This picture here, this just tries to show you his math that he did to uh, figure out the distances between the sun, moon, and earth, or sun, earth, moon. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about the math because he's just way off. There's really no point. But this big circle represents the sun. This one right here represents the earth, and this smaller one represents the moon. Okay. Next up, Eratosthenes. So Eratosthenes, 276 BC to 194 BC. Eratosthenes is one of the librarians of that famous library I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Library of Alexandria. So um, Eratosthenes, he is famous because he's actually able to calculate pretty accurately, very and actually very accurately for the time. Uh, he, he's 
uh, very, very close to the actual number, but he's actually able to calculate the circumference of the Earth. So since he can calculate a circumference, that means that the Earth has to be round. So we know at this point in time that the Earth is round. And the way he did this, so look at that, his, uh, he was only off by 0 0.5 to uh, anywhere between 0.5 to 17%. And the reason we don't really know the exact number is because we're not actually sure uh, what the measurement system was he used. He, it was called a stadia, but we don't actually know what a stadia is, is equal to. So we're not sure, but he could have been just maybe even half a percent off. That was it. So pretty incredible at this time that he's able to measure the circumference of the Earth. And the way he does it, uh, in Syene, so Syene is a town, and there's this well. And on the summer solstice, uh, on the, the day of the summer solstice, at noon, specifically at noon, the sun's light will shine directly down into this well, and there is no shadow. The sun's light is just perfectly directly down into the well. And at the time, we think about 5,000 stadia away from Syene is Alexandria. So... Alexandria is where Eratosthenes is a librarian. And the reason we know it's 5,000 stadia is because they actually had, at the time, they had these, these guys that would uh, measure the distances. They would actually walk and they would count their footsteps. And they were very, very accurate and precise. They, they did this so much that they knew exactly how big each of their footsteps was. And they could calculate the distance between Syene and Alexandria using their footprints. So we have a distance here of... of around 5,000 stadia or so between Syene and, and Alexandria. And we know that in Syene, sunlight, the shadow of the sun, there is no shadow of the sun because the, the light shines directly down this well. But in Alexandria, uh, what Eratosthenes did was he put up a known, a, a, a rod. He, he put a rod in the ground of a known distance, and then he measured the, uh, the angle that was cast of the shadow from the rod. And he noticed the angle, I do believe it was like seven degrees. And doing a little math here, he was able to calculate the circumference of the earth based upon the angle of the rod uh, in Alexandria compared to there being no angle in Syene. So with that, he was able to calculate the circumference of the earth. Pretty incredible for the time. All right, this is the last guy we got to talk about today. So another Greek guy here. Notice you'll see... Uh, he has a beard, nice long beard. Typically, you'll see um, in astronomy, the longer the beard, the smarter the guy. That's usually how this works. So this guy's got a really big beard here. So who could this guy be? So Silent Bob, you, you guys probably don't even know who Silent Bob is, but Silent Bob was in a bunch of uh, 90s mute movies like uh, Clerks and Mall Rats and Chasing Amy. Uh, but probably not Silent Bob, but what about this one? Maybe Santa Claus. He looks like he could be Santa Claus. Looks like a nice fellow, but probably not. Or could it be Hipparchus? So yes, this is Hipparchus. So Hipparchus, um, he was actually another uh, librarian of Alexandria, and he is known as the father of trigonometry, also sometimes known as the father of astronomy as well, uh, based upon his observations. So he was very good at observing, and what he did was he went out and observed uh, the stars, and he actually made a star catalog. Um, so father of astronomy, father of tri trigonometry, and made this very, very impressive, very accurate star catalog. In his star catalog, he had uh, over 850 stars in it. Uh, and so what he would do is he would go outside and he would draw just using his you know pen that he had, his ink pen, and he would uh, in, or quill, whatever he had back then, uh, and he would just make maps of the stars, over 850 of them. And then he would cl categorize them based upon brightness. In astronomy, we call brightness, it's called magnitude. Make sure you know that. So brightness is magnitude. And he was, he was accurate with pretty much every star he looked at. He was accurate. Uh, and this was a really big deal because it took him years to make this star catalog. But once the star catalog is made, this means now that anyone that uh, wants to study astronomy after him, they already have access to his star catalog. That way, they don't have to spend years of their own time making a star catalog. Now they can go on and, and you know use that star catalog for studying other things. So you're going to start to see how science builds on science. So astronomy builds on astronomy. So we have the star catalog now. Now we can start using that star catalog to, to branch off and, and learning about other things in the sky. So he's, he's, he's really famous for that star catalog. Keep in mind, he didn't have a telescope. He didn't have these tools 
uh, to go out and, and look and, and measure things with. He used his eyes. So bare eye observation. I, I, I dare you to try it. Go outside tonight. If it's a clear night. Look up in the sky and see if you can categorize the stars based on brightness, which means let's say you, you, you have a five number system and you go outside and you say, okay, that star, that star is a little brighter than this star, but not as bright as this star, but brighter than this star. So he was able to do that accurately with over 850 stars, classify, uh, categorizing them based upon brightness. That, that is very, very impressive. And that's not the only thing he did. So he is also known as the father of trigonometry, which means he used a lot of math, a lot of trig. And what he was able to do was he was able to calculate uh, precession. So this is just a little bit about Hipparchus here. So born in 180 BC, uh, lived in Turkey. Again, he was a librarian in the city of uh, the Library of, of Alexandria, and he calculates pr precession. So you need to know about precession, and you need to know that he had a star catalog of over 850 stars, categorized by brightness. And so, uh, precession. Think about uh, as a kid, you had the the tops that you could spin on the surface of a table, like a uh, like a dreidel. Actually, you spin it, and it has energy, and it's it's just stands upright and spins. But what happens to it as it starts losing energy? Energy, it'll actually start to wobble as it's rotating around on its axis. And Hipparchus figured out that that's actually what the Earth does. The Earth wobbles on its axis as it rotates. So the Earth is actually rotating. And he was able to the, uh, he was able to figure this out by looking up at the stars. And he noticed that the stars shift positions in the sky. And the reason that is is because the Earth is wobbling on its axis as it rotates. Granted, it's a very, very slow wobble. The Earth takes about 26,000 years to wobble once. So every 26,000 years, the Earth goes through one cycle of precession. So what that means is, it means that the North Star actually changes. So our North Star right now is called Polaris. Uh, in 13,000 years, our North Star will, will be... Um, sorry, hang on. Our, 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 uh, I can't talk. Our North Star in 13,000 years will be Vega. Here's a, a picture of it showing you. And then uh, in 3000 BC, our North Star was actually Thuban. So our North Star right now is Polaris, which is the dog. Uh, I'm sorry. It's not the dog. My bad. Uh, Polaris is the North Star, which is in uh, Ursa Minor, the little bear. Uh, and then you have Vega. Uh, Vega will be the North Star in 13,000 years. And Vega is in the constellation Lear the Harp. And then you have Thuban. Thuban was the cons was the uh, North Star back when the Egyptians were in power, 3000 BC, and that's uh, part of the constellation Draco, the dragon. So as the Earth spins, it rotate as it's rotating, spinning, it wobbles along on its axis. So this is the wobble here. You see the wobble, and it shows you the North Star, how it's going to change from Polaris and go to Vega in 13,000 years. So uh, that's it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to start talking about uh, Ptolemy and Ptolemy's model, a uh, geocentric model of the universe. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about Ptolemy, and then we're going to get into um, the Dark Ages, what happened in the Dark Ages, and we're going to learn about Copernicus and Galileo. Those are the big ones that we're going to be talking about coming up soon. Thanks, guys.